you guys so much for leading us in song this morning. And uh, I'm really excited to open up the Word of God with you. So if you have a copy of uh, the Bible with you, and I hope that you have a copy of God's Word. If not, we have them in the back of our resource table, so feel free to go grab them. But if you have a copy, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Uh, we've spent the last uh, two weeks now uh, walking through the first section of Ephesians 2, and we've said that Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, might be the most important text in all of the Bible. Uh, it really, I think, is a summary of the story of the Bible, right? Verses 1 through 3 sort of sets the plot for us, right? It's right, Genesis 3, and it, it tells us what state that we all live in as human beings, and it says in a very explicit terms how devastating is the problem that faces mankind. Remember that. That we are uh, dead in our sins. We, we have no spiritual life in us. And that we're deceived by the world and by Satan and even by our own wicked hearts. And because we have gone after the wickedness that's in our hearts and the deception of this world, we are doomed for the just wrath of our holy creator. That's what we call the bad news. Now, but verse 4 is the hinge verse in the text. And again, it's really the hinge verse of the whole Bible. The whole Bible turns on those two words, right? But God. But God did something about our hopeless situation. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. We were dead in our sins and God has made all of us who have put our faith in Jesus alive. We were dead, now we are alive. We were deceived, but now we live in the very truth of God. We were doomed, but now we have a sure and a certain hope in our salvation. And that text ended, verse 10, you'll remember, with the hope not only of what lies ahead of us in eternity future, but, but also with a promise of our earthly transformation now. Remember, the apostle says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we just marveled at the end of that text at the fact that God not only saves us from the doom of judgment, but He transforms us. He changes our walk. He changes the way that we live our lives. And that theme continues as we begin to delve now into the next portion of chapter 2. The grace of God doesn't just change our future destinies. It changes how we live personally now and it changes the way that we relate to other people. Particularly, it changes the way we live in relationship to other believers. So let's go ahead and read it. I'm going to start in verse 11. I'm going to read the whole uh, of the rest of the chapter. So we'll go all the way down to chapter or to verse 22. Uh, but we're not going to get through all of this today. We'll finish it up uh, later. By the way, we're going to be taking a little break from our Ephesians study to do a, a little Advent series. So we'll actually get back to this in, in January. <laughs> so we'll leave you hanging here, all right? But uh, let's start. Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. Therefore... Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in him... You also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's pray and ask once again for God to give us 
eyes to see His truth. Lord, we are thankful for the Word of God. We've already read it this morning. We've sang truths that find their uh, foundation in the Word of God, and now we're reading and preaching through this text. And I ask that, Lord, if we are indeed being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, that I pray, Lord, we will experience Your dwelling here by the Spirit this morning. I pray that by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that You would open our eyes that we may see, that we may be able to comprehend the breadth and the depth of Your love, that we might know that which is unknowable, God. I pray that we might see the truths of these texts and be transformed by them. Lord, please, I beg of You, help us not simply to be hearers of the Word, help us to be understanders of the Word, and then, of course, doers of the Word. In fact, help us to understand the Word so as to affect everything we do. Lord, I pray this, and I do it in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, this, this past uh, April marked the 30-year anniversary of the infamous Los Angeles riots. Some of you might remember those. I remember I was a young man at the time. Uh, these riots were a terrible tragedy. It, it left over 60 people dead. Well over 2,000 people were injured. And it resulted, 30 years ago, just keep that in mind, this is 30 years ago, it resulted in roughly a billion dollars in property damage in the city of Los Angeles. And these riots took place in response to the acquittal of three out of four police officers who were videotaped brutally beating an unarmed black man named Rodney Keaton. Uh, it was at that time a rare moment in the media where such a thing was caught on tape. We, of course, unfortunately, because people have cameras on phones, we uh, unfortunately see these types of videos often now, but back then that was a rare thing, and so it brought outrage. And the outrage resulted in violence and looting and destruction. In the middle of uh, the, the looting and the riots, the, the city thought it would be a good idea to bring Rodney King before the media. And so they brought him up and his lawyer had given him a, a prepared statement to read, but in the last moment he decided to scrap it and just go off the cuff. And he said that famous line, maybe some of you remember, can we all get along? Can we all just get along? It was a, a powerful moment. And I think it really gets at the heart of the tension that we feel in this world. Can we all just get along? No, we struggle not to be at odds with one another as humans. And here we are now in America 30 years later, and the divide in our own country seems to be greater than it's ever been. The racial and political tensions are boiling hot, and they're creating devastation. Communities are being fragmented. Families are being fractured seemingly beyond, beyond the hope of repair. And so we look at this human strife and we fall in despair. We feel the weight of this divide, don't we? We all kind of just want to say those same emotional words. Why can't we just get along? We all want a solution to that problem. And we seem to constantly be grasping only to find ourselves even more fractured and more frustrated. But friends, into that very despair comes the hope of the gospel. Into, admittedly, this unsolvable human problem of human strife comes the beauty of Jesus Christ. Our text today, like the first ten verses, has a hinge moment, right? Like verse ten had the but God moment there in verse four. Well, here it's in verse 13. But now, but now, in Christ, the divisions of this world actually can find their peace. And so that forms our main idea today. The only hope for earthly division is heavenly reconciliation. I want you to hear that. The only hope for earthly division is heavenly reconciliation. So let's dive into it. Let, let's first note the surface problem of, of division, specifically in our text, ethnic division. It says there in verse 11, Therefore, remember at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. So we'll stop there. Uh, Paul kind of inserts something here. He says, therefore, remember at one time you Gentiles. And, and then he, he kind of like goes on this little tangent for a moment here. And now remember, who's this, 
Who is this letter written to? It's written to the Ephesian church, or if you believe this to be a circular letter, it was still written to a circuit of churches that were Gentile in nature. This was a Gentile church. And so Paul is reminding these Gentile believers, most of them, of the unfortunate divide that existed between them and the Jewish people. He wants them to remember that, that the division existed. And the word Gentile, there's the word ethnos. It, it means nation or people. It's where, of course, we get our word ethnicity from. An ethnic group that describes in the Bible anybody that's not Jewish. So there's the Jews and there's the Gentiles. And you can see here that Paul is drawing out that this divide isn't that just that Jews and Gentiles don't hang out. It's that they're at odds with one another. It's Jew versus Gentile. This is animosity. That little side statement that he makes there about the, those who are called the circumcision, called you the uncircumcision, that's a statement of separation. That, 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 that title, uncircumcision, is not just describing someone and, you know, they like to wear dark clothing. No, that was a, not a term of endearment on the lips of a Jew. I mean, think about uh, a story we all know pretty well, the story of David and Goliath. We, we went through this a few years ago when we did... Uh, uh, the book of 1 Samuel, right? Before God's people stood that Philistine giant who was yelling uh, terrible things at them, who was defaming and disregarding their God. And you remember how David addressed him? He, he could have just said, who's this Philistine? But what does he say? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, of course, that was a very appropriate label or Right. David was getting exactly at the heart of what this man is, but make no mistake, that was meant to be a shameful term. It, it, it was a derogatory term. I won't go dive deeply into this this morning, but that term, of course, is referring to those who had not received the mark of God's old covenant in the Old Testament, which was circumcision. Circumcision was the visible sign of being a part of God's people. And if you didn't have that sign, you were not only not among God's people, you were counted among God's enemy, the, the enemies of God's people. So there was this division, there was this separation. But here, there was hostility. I mean, is, is this is not what Paul's talking about in this text. Christ has torn down the dividing wall of hostility. And the word hostility is appropriate in every sense of the word when it came to the relationship between Jews and Gentiles. And we, of course, are all too aware, and knowing even in our uh, history that we study in classes, of the horrors of Gentile hostility toward Jews. I mean, even in current events, right? Uh, just recently, uh, NBA star Kyrie Irving made some anti-Semitic comments over Twitter, and it's been everywhere, and it's caused a lot of hurt and pain. We can go down to the Holocaust Museum and feel the weight of the unimaginable evil that took place in Auschwitz and other concentration camps where millions of Jews were slaughtered. Genocidal hatred toward the Jews goes well beyond Germany, though, and the Nazis, right? It goes all the way back into the Bible. You might remember the book of Esther where a man named Haman wanted to wipe out the, the entirety of the Jewish people, and it was only... By God using uh, the, uh, the efforts of a brave, faith-filled woman named Esther that they were saved. So there was hatred. And that hatred went both ways, of course. Throughout their wonderful history as God's people, Israel struggled, did they not, to feel a superiority over the Gentiles. Uh, they thought of them as nothing more than dogs. They were cast out, separated. In fact, when Paul talks about the dividing wall of hostility, he might have been literally thinking about the wall that divided the Jews and the Gentiles in the temple. There was this wall there uh, that separated the, the court, what they called the court of the Gentiles, and the inner court of the Jerusalem temple. And that was an impassable separation. You're not welcome beyond this wall. And in fact, it, so uh, severe it wasn't to cross that barrier, it was an offense that would bring death to the offender. And you can see a prime example of that in Acts chapter 21. The Jews wanted to kill Paul because they thought that he had brought an Ephesian Jew, or an Ephesian Gentile named Trophimus into the temple, beyond the court of the Gentiles into the inner court. They were outraged by this. The very thought of their Jewish standing as God's people being blemished by the presence of an uncircumcised Gentile was unthinkable. It's really an amazing story. You should go back and read it. 
They were about to kill Paul. They were, they were carrying him away even to the, the Roman uh, uh, barracks. The Romans kind of came in and saved him from death there. But he stops them and he's like, I want to address the crowd. So the crowd actually got quiet and listened to Paul as Paul began to talk about and share kind of his conversion experience. And they were listening intently until he gets to Acts 22 21. And it says, He that is God said to me, this is Paul speaking, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And listen to this. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. They were sitting there listening to Paul until he said one word. What word did he say? Gentiles. It's like a cuss word. So Paul, he's just bringing to the surface this tension of this division that existed here. And he wants the Gentiles to remember the immense animosity and separation, even while hinting in that little phrase there that that separation was one that was put in place by a restriction that had now passed away. Circumcision, at least in a physical sense, right, was not what makes someone holy and right before God. He points out the circumcision was made in the flesh by the hands. In other words, Paul, I think, is getting, he's unfolding his argument here. There's a much deeper issue to play than the physical side of the old covenant. And that's where he turns next to the real problem of spiritual division. The real problem was, wasn't that they didn't have the physical sign on their body. The real problem, problem was the spiritual division that they lived in. And those who call themselves the circumcision are not, by the mere presence of that mark, really among God's people. That's not your problem. The problem is spiritual in nature. So Paul shows them the three-part issue here. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and were strangers to the covenants of promise. And the result was you had no hope and was without God. Remember. Uh, do you know, this is really interesting to me, I love, I speak out and stuff like this. The first three chapters we've talked about, it's all indicatives, indicatives, indicatives. There's one command, one imperative verb, right there it is. Remember. Remember. He wants them to remember this, three things. Number one, you were separated from God's presence. We were at that time separated from Christ, therefore we had no hope when we were without God. Christ, of course, being God in the flesh. As Gentiles, there were no hope built even into the fabric of their life of the coming Messiah. And we were all far from the hope of knowing God. That is, we had no access to the God of creation. And there's this massive chasm between us and the one who made us. It was a chasm that we can never breach. A chasm that would result in the doom that we spoke about in the first three verses. And friends, we all feel the weight of this chasm, whether we realize it or not, because we were created to walk with God, to talk with God, to be in relationship with God, to, to worship Him and know Him. We were created to be in an intimate relationship, but our sin has reaped for us separation. As the philosopher Blaise Pascal famously said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. Mm. And there is this pain in all of us because we are separated from Christ. And I want you to hear this a lot of our theme today. That pain from the absence of our vertical relationship always results in painful animosity horizontally in our earthly relationships. And think about it. The very first result of Adam and Eve's sin. After hiding from God, what do they do? They hid from one another. They blamed one another. Their son, Cain, rose up and killed his brother, Abel. Why? Because God had rejected his sacrifice. You remember that? And so, when there was a rift vertically, it resulted in an anger and murder horizontally. Do you see how these bills fall or not? From separation to Christ to separation from God's people. So the second piece is we're separated from God's people. We were all alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. The word alienated uh, excuse me. It means to be a foreigner, to be estranged, to be excluded. 
And they were estranged from the commonwealth of Israel, commonwealth Pulitea, and the Greek means citizenship. So we were estranged, Gentile brothers and sisters, from the citizenship of God's people. We were, as Peter puts it in 1 Peter, once not a people. We were once not a people. And that, of course, was a reality in the physical limitations of not being allowed in the Jewish temple and the culture of Jewish life, but it was deeper than that. It was deeper than that. To be a citizen means to have certain rights as a citizen, right? I, I'm an American citizen. I have certain rights as an American citizen that I lose when I go somewhere else. And so they, we Gentiles, were excluded from the rights of citizenship in Israel. Citizenship among God's people. We as Gentiles were on the outside looking in. And because of that, the third piece is true. We were separated from God's promises. We were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise. Uh, you got to love how Paul here views the continuity of the Bible. These covenants were not one-offs in Paul's mind. They all worked together. They were a part of a grand plan, and they were all pointing to what? A promise. The promise of redemption through the Messiah. That's the one thing all the covenants of the Old Testament shared was that of promise. And therefore, Paul exhorts these Gentiles to remember the weight of life with no promise. Now, that is a life with no hope, a life without God in the world. How great the pain of such separation. But here it comes, right? The transition verse. But now. But now. Very much in line with but God above. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Mm. And once again, friends, looking back and remembering creates this tension of a problem, the problem of division. And once again, the only solution is Jesus. Mm -hmm. The only solution. Mm -hmm. How beautiful is the power of the blood of Jesus. Mm. It's not the teaching of Jesus, as good as they are, the miracles of Jesus. It is the shed blood of Jesus that, uh, that bridges the great chasm that sin has created. And the heart of what follows here is a powerful picture, my friends, of how the gospel brings supernatural unity to the fractured relationships here on earth. Specifically, in this text, he's talking about the, the fracture between Jews and Gentiles, but the principle can be carried over to any sort of earthly divide that we might experience. Our only hope to be unified in this world is the shed blood of Christ. I want you to notice six reasons the blood of Christ has brought us unity. Number one, we are unified in Christ because we both have had our relationship restored. Mm -hmm. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's beautiful, isn't it? We were far off, but by the cross of Christ, we've been brought near to God. That, that chasm has been breached. And now, not only are we not objects of God's wrath, but we're near to Him. Well, that's a picture of intimacy. This is what the gospel produces. When you love someone, you're near them and you want to be near them. Now, I can remember one of the worst mission trip experiences I've ever had. We were coming back from a really great week in Nicaragua and I woke up the morning of our, our long trip home and I felt this throbbing pain in my big toe. And... I knew right away I was having a gout attack. Now, I'll spare you all the details about gout. I won't bore you with those details, but uh, it's really painful. And it was going to be a long day. I had to navigate three airports, customs, and everything in between. And I can remember so vividly to this day sitting on a nasty floor of an airport in Panama, miserable as you could be, talking to Denise on the phone. My dearly beloved bride, to whom I often turn to when I'm hurting. And I remember saying, I cannot wait to get home. I just need a hug from you. I want to be near to you. And let me tell you, friends, when I climbed into bed that night, being near to her never felt quite as sweet. I think this is the point Paul's drawing out. Think about the reality of hopelessness. And then remember this. You've been brought near to the God of the universe. You were once far off, but now you're in the loving arms of a loving Savior. Feel the warmth of that. Feel the power of that. You've been called into the intimate relationship with God that you were created for. You have that intimacy with Him, brother and sister. And, and you think, 
Well, how does this affect those horizontal relationships? Listen, it, it heals these horizontal divides because that's true of all Christians. We've been all been brought into the same intimate love, right? Now, which means that we have this common ground that supersedes any earthly difference we might have. We love each other because we have a mutual closeness to God. That closeness becomes more important than our nationality, than our race, than our socioeconomic status, or any other thing that might separate us. We love each other because we share an affection for God. You know, when I was a, a youth pastor, I used to talk about the triangle with couples. You know, anybody ever seen this visual? You know, so me, you got Denise, and the closer we get to Jesus, guess what happens to us? The closer we become. And I think that's a beautiful analogy of what Paul's driving in. Like, the more we understand and live in light of our nearness to Christ, right, the closer we're going to get to one another. Love each other because we share that affection. We were all far off. We've all been brought there. It's beautiful. Not only that, but notice also that we are unified in Christ because we have both been released from the chains of the law. Here's what Paul says in verses 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. How, how, how did he break it down? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. So this, there was this wall set up, right? A wall that separated, and that wall was the law. The Jewish people had been given the law of Moses. The Gentiles didn't have the law. But, but here's the thing. Even though the Jews had the law, the law was a wall even to them, wasn't it? I mean, the law of Moses was essentially given as a picture of the holiness of God, and it served as a way, in some, in some sense, to show us how far short we fall of God's glory. The Jews had the law, but the law was a burden they couldn't bear. Paul explains that in Galatians 3, verses 19 through 26. I'm going to read all of that, but he talks about how the law was a guardian of sorts until Christ came, and, and he says we were cap held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. That the presence of the law was a chain of sorts, but not because the law was bad, but because it was a constant reminder of how unable we were as those dead in our transgressions to live as God had called us to. So even though it was a wall that God had set up, so to speak, between the Jew and Gentiles, it was a wall even to the Jews. I mean, think about the temple. I mean, the temple was all about walls, wasn't it? Walls or, and or curtains, same idea, right? There were these barriers to the presence of God. And they were all reminders that God was unapproachable. But now, by the blood of Christ, the requirement of the law has been fulfilled. Not done away with, but fulfilled in Jesus. And therefore, it has been abolished in some sense. Not, not the moral law, we're still bound to follow God that way, right? But we don't carry the law in the sense of access to God. We are now in Christ all free. Christ has set us free. And this is the key, again, I believe, to horizontal unity. No one, listen to this, no one has more freedom in Christ than another. Uh, the cross of Jesus has brought freedom to us all. And so we love and we walk in that freedom together. You know, thirdly here, we are unified in Christ because we have been remade as God's people. Since Christ has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. I really love this. In Christ, we have been created, church, as one new man. Right? I remember last week we talked about being alive in Christ. I Reference 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Well, friends, a part of being a new creation is that you were created as a part of God, making one new man in place of the two. So now, before there was Jew and Gentile, but now, for those in Christ, there is one term. Christian. And God's people are not, not the bloodline of the Jewish people. They are the blood bulk children of Christ. Our primary identity then, our primary identity is that one new man. Our primary identity is you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. Man, how do you respond when someone asks you to define yourself? 
If you define yourself in earthly terms, you know, I mean, it's okay, right, to have some pride in your nationality, you know. Tyler and Rama were lifting the other day, and Tyler during the World Cup was chanting USA, and Rama was chanting England, all right. That's okay. But what's your primary identity? As a Christian, it's not I'm an American or I'm Chinese, I'm rich, I'm poor, I'm black, I'm white, I'm single or I'm married, I'm young or I'm old. Friends, it's we are those who were once dead who are now alive in Christ. My identity is I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. That's our unifying anchor, brothers and sisters. And that's why churches, can I just say, ought to be filled with a diverse group of people who have no earthly reason to be together except that we're all Christian, mm -hmm. that we are in Christ. Mm -hmm. So, college student, hear this with love. This is one reason that you need to be involved with the church, not just the student ministry. Mm -hmm. Student ministries are, are great, they're wonderful gifts, but the church is the grand display of being one new man in place of the two. It's a visual of that. Married with kids, this is why you need to have singles involved in your life. Older people, this is why you need younger people. Younger people, this is why you need older people, right? Oh, how I lament. And I hear this often, people who leave this church or that church to, to go find one where the people are in the same life stage as they are in. Or look just like them. Mm. I understand that impulse. Trust me, I get it. But I believe it misses the beauty of the gospel. Mm -hmm. The gospel accomplishes unity. We're created as one people under the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. That's a compelling community. Paul continues here. We are unified in Christ because we've both been reconciled from our sins. So there's a lot of overlap in these things. And we'll just go verse by verse through this. That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile, to circle these two words, us both to God in one body through the cross, uh, through the cross thereby killing the hostility. How is the hostility horizontally put to death? By understanding this, that the one thing that we all share, no matter where we're from, no matter what our culture is or our background is, the one thing that we share is our need to be reconciled to God. And the power that we have in, as if you're a Christian, that you have been reconciled to God. There's the one trait that crosses over every culture, every gender, every age, is that we're all sinners deserving of God's justice. And if we're Christians, the one thing we share is that we all receive grace. There is not one of us in this room who needed grace more or less than any of the person to your right or left. There's not one of us who, whose need for reconciliation was less than someone else's. Look, I don't care if you grew up in a Christian home and your dad was a pastor. I don't care if you grew up in a home that practiced witchcraft. You both need reconciled. Mm -hmm. And because but we have the same need and we have the same salvation, we are then what? According to Paul, we're one body. We're one body. So you see, our salvation is the key to unity. Now, do you believe that, church? Or are we continuing to struggle not to define each other by the standards and identities of the world? We who are Christians are all reconciled. It's the only common ground we need, really. And he moves on here. He uh, points out that we are unified in Christ because we both receive God's peace. He says, already said it in verse 15. Christ made peace, but then he drives it home again in verse 17. He came, I love this, he came and preached peace to those who were far off and Peace to those who are near. Uh, he's driving home this point that the preaching of the bring and the bringing of the peace of God was something that needed uh, was needed by those who grew up with those covenants of promise, those who were circumcised on the eighth day and went to the temple all the time, and those who were among the pagan Gentiles. Both Jews and Gentiles needed peace, the peace that Christ brought. Paul's talks about this peace. What peace is he talking about? Well, certainly earthly peace, but Paul reminds us, Romans 5, we have been, therefore, we have, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. A peace with God simply means the offense of our sin has been removed. Thereby, the hostility vertically has been removed. We are no longer enemies of God. We are justified. We are declared righteous. And we have a right relationship with Him 
for eternity and because that peace was necessary for both Jews and Gentiles, the natural fruit then is peace horizontally. Because the greatest offense has been removed, it's been covered and atoned for. That means that the lesser offenses that happen laterally in our church should reflect the grace of God and the peace of God. One more. We are unified in Christ because we have both received equal access to God. Verse 18. For through Him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. I just want you to hear this as simply as it's said. There are no classes of Christians. There, there is not a caste system in the Christian church. We all have access to the Father. The pastor doesn't have more access than, than the Christian sitting in the pew. Uh, rich Christians don't have more access than poor Christians, or vice versa. And even, listen to this, even mature, this might kind of rub against our logic a little bit, but even more mature Christians don't have more access than immature Christians. And that's why a church can have unity even when it's not just a bunch of mature people together. You have mature Christians and immature Christians having unity in Christ because we all have equal access to the Father. It's a wonderful truth that drives our unity. We have come to the throne of God together to find mercy in Him. So, where does this text land on your heart this morning? Now, let me end with three really quick applications. And this will, some of these We've already alluded to throughout. So it's just kind of reiterating. Uh, the theme, first of all, of the sermon. First application. Our only hope for social divides is Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't think a lot about the Jew-Gentile divide, but again, we feel strains of racial tensions in our country, big time. We feel the immense struggle not to be divided over political parties or social issues. But friends, my, my hope is this morning that you'll walk away more convinced than ever that our only hope for these is the gospel. These are only hope, even as we grieve the divisions that will inevitably walk in until his return. Jesus is our only hope, not politics. There's so many Christians who act as if politics is the hope. Mm. Not more education. That's not our hope. Not even systemic reform as, as worthy as an endeavor as that might be. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. Mm -hmm. and, and so maybe even our discussions on important issues like racism, and we need to talk about them, you know, be laced heavily with the gospel. Mm -hmm. okay, can I just say it bluntly here? If Trump or Biden's name is more prevalent in those discussions than the name of Jesus, heaven help us. If Republican or Democrat is the one man we long to see, heaven help us. Jesus is our only hope. Number two, our only hope for unity in the body of Christ is Jesus. So if that first application is sort of broad, like how do we address the, the tensions and divides in this world by sharing the gospel, right? Man, let's bring it a little closer to home here. Our only hope to be unified, Aletheia Church, is the gospel. It's not a church that looks a certain way. It's not making sure that we're championing the right social issue or not. It's focusing hard and fast and long on the gospel. But we're all going to disagree about which social issues deserve more of our attention than others. But friends, so long as the gospel is of first importance, we can be unified no matter what. We can. It doesn't matter what our race or gender or political party is. And finally, to bring it down to a personal level, you're only hope to be unified to God is Jesus. Mm -hmm. but friend, if you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus, please know, I hope you didn't miss this. I hope you felt the tension of this. You are far off from God right now. But you can be brought near to Him. Mm -hmm. You can be saved not just from the judgment of hell, which is very real, but you can be brought into an intimate relationship with God. Mm. A God you can talk to like a friend. Mm -hmm. You can walk with. Friend, you are an enemy of God because of your sin and you will be judged, but you can be reconciled. So friend, if that's you today, please know 
Their only hope is Jesus, who came to this earth, who died on a cross in your place so that your sins could be covered. Would you put your faith in Him today? We pray that you will, that you'll be reconciled to Christ, that we can have access together, be unified the way the world does not understand. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the Bible. <laughs> amazing to me how often I we, we kind of come to logical conclusions after a while that you know, God has it right. The Bible has it right. I thank you for this text, Lord, particularly a lot of the fact that all the division that we feel and experience, God, we're so nervous sometimes to offend or to be offended or whatever it might be, God. And we're just always looking for all the differences and the ways that we've been wrong. Lord, they exist because we're all sinners, God. But Lord, our only hope for the dividing wall of hostility to be torn down between Jew and Gentile, the only hope for the dividing wall of hostility to be torn down between divides that we have created here on earth based upon the color of our skin or where we live or where we're from or or you know, what, uh, what political party we vote for. Our only hope is Jesus. And we just cry out, Jesus, please heal us. And we ask, please, God, help us within the body. Help us here in the church, God, to not live like the world. I'm grieved, God. That's the church. We still act as if we're divided. We still act as if there's a a court over here for these people and a court over here for these people. Oh God, make us one as you are one, even as we read, to begin our service today. Help us to live in unity, God, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray, Lord, that someone here today is far off from you, that today might be the day they are brought here. God, would you save them? Lord, you are so good. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory, Lord. Everything in this book tells us our salvation is for the glory of God. So we'll praise you and give you all the praise today. Lord, just work in our hearts and our lives. We ask in the name of Christ our Lord.